I was discussing this morning the way in which time, which is a measure of motion, involves us in certain illusions. Principally what I call the historical illusion. That is to say that the meaning of human life lies in living through a progression of events which culminates and finds its satisfaction in a future. And trying to show you how in various ways the illusion of history has been extremely destructive to people. How, for example, it fascinates us with symbols. They may be symbols of wealth, such as money, or symbols of status, so that the people who are in our world highly successful cannot understand why their lives are so empty. Because they lack presence, they lack uh, the full, ri rich relationship to the physical world in the here and now. And because they don't understand why they're so miserable, they think they can cure their situation by more of the same. That is to say, by bigger and better futures, more money, more power, more status. And so they go on compounding the problem and still failing to understand why they're increasingly miserable. And uh, they don't know what they want because their wants have, as it were, grown to dimensions where they're inconceivable. And so they also don't know who they are because they have confused their true organic living being with the mask, the persona, the role constellated around the ego which they have uh, been taught to believe themselves to be. None of this is to underrate the real uses of time, that is to say of clocks, because all time is a matter of clocks. There is no time in nature. There is rhythm in nature. Yes, there is motion in nature. But the clock as a measure of motion is a human artifact. The world as it spins on its axis doesn't tick. And I also pointed out that the calibration of the clock, whereby we have hairlines to designate the point at which a certain second occurs, is symbolic of the emptiness of our moments. When the moment is reduced to a hairline, you feel that it's here and gone. That you can't ever really be now because it's all flying away, all flying away. And you can never sit down and be there. This was Faust's problem, you see. When he attains his highest moment and is calling, Ah, still delay, thou art so fair. See? Uh, the moment is a very curious thing. Uh, it isn't fleeting at all. It looks as if it is, but it isn't. The moment is always with you. And this is the point. Uh, to understand this is the point of all those spiritual exercises which are concerned with concentrating on what you are doing now and keeping your mind on it. For example, in the practice of the Japanese tea ceremony, the entire art of it is to have complete presence of mind, to be completely with doing just this thing. So likewise, in um, all sorts of yoga uh, exercises, try and be completely now. The whole training of a Zen monk, day in and day out throughout his discipline, whether it's meditation or whether it's work or sweeping or cooking or eating or whatever it is, they, they keep insisting, do what you're doing, eat when you're hungry, sleep when you're tired. 
and do that. But the point of that exercise is uh, that after you practice it for a while, it suddenly occurs to you with a great shock, which is a sort of satori, that there is nowhere else to be but the moment. You cannot be anywhere else. It doesn't flow away, it's always here. Maybe a lot of things flow through it. Uh, forms change, experiences change, rhythms change, and so on. But it's always there. So you have plenty of time in the sense of real time, which is the moment. To have time is to have the moment. And you remember the story that Flory told at the end of last session, where the, uh, the uh, Dalai Lama's brother says that, yes, it was very nice to come to the United States, but the problem of the difference between here and Tibet was that uh, here you have all sorts of uh, power and whatnot, but you have no time. In Tibet, you have a very primitive existence and lots of time. And uh, it's so interesting to get into a culture that is so-called primitive. It's very easy because you can now take a jet plane to Puerto Vallarta uh, in a matter of a very short time. You can be uh, in touch with a culture that is ageless because you only have to go from Puerto Vallarta down north or south to the Indian villages along the coast, which you can only reach by boat or by a jeep through jungle roads, which are just terrible. And you get out to these people, and suddenly everything stops. <laughs> you know, where are they going? They're doing the things they've always done. And it's sort of a, it, we, we, we always say, it's a sleepy village. Not very exciting. So, actually, Zen is the art of combining an exciting life with living in the complete present. <laughs> Very curious. It's not sleepy at all. It's not like you would think of a sleepy village. When you watch uh, Zen monks walking, they don't dawdle. They're like cats. You know how a cat crosses a road? It has a complete kind of... It knows where it's going. It just goes like that. And that's like a Zen monk walking. It's the most curious combination of what you would call the virtues of economy, of uh, expertness in doing what you do, and at the same time not being in any hurry, in any hurry. This Zen master in San Francisco, Suzuki Roshi, uh, is particularly admired by his students for achieving an enormous amount of work uh, without ever seeming to make the slightest effort. And he can move. They've just been uh, working down at Tassajara Springs, and they have rearranged a rocky stream to make it look more natural. And <laughs> he can move bigger rocks than any of the tough young men who are working along with him. Simply fantastic. But it's all based on a real relationship to the material, especially to the material moment, and working in such a way that you never strain yourself because you never rush. You don't have in mind the goal and being wanting to get there in the greatest possible hurry. You have in mind simply that every phase of doing the work which will eventually arrive at that goal is as much worth doing as when you're playing music. You are involved completely in the production of the sounds as they go along without hurrying them to reach the end. That's the same with sex. A lot of people are in a hurry to reach the end. 
and therefore they don't they, ne they never have sexual satisfaction because they have nothing but orgasms and uh, although people have talked a great deal about the importance of the orgasm and that's true and right and perfectly proper it's worth nothing without the build up uh, you know it would be the same thing as taking dietetic pills where you have a few pills which contain all the essential nutrition throw them down get on with real life or by having some substitute for sleep that you could take in a pill and not have to sleep incidentally I just want to put in a parenthesis here about the importance of sleep there is a very special kind of sleep which the Hindus call sushupti sleep without dreams and very deep And uh, it's, isn't, isn't sleep funny that you go to bed and time is totally eliminated until you wake up. And you seem to wake up immediately after you went to sleep and yet something happened. Now, uh, th there, there is a way of getting into completely profound sleep. which I call, I don't know where I got the word, I call it a temple sleep. And it, I found it best uh, in a protected area out of doors on a sunny afternoon or at night where you get under a tree and uh, you get a suitable pad and you lie on your back and you simply open up like a cat does or a dog does sometimes you stretch in every direction like this and you surrender to the earth and you sink you let go you imagine your body is extremely heavy so that it's dropping into the earth and you just let yourself go to the night with the kind of feeling that uh, you are uh, being moved through by immensely powerful life energy healing energy or whatever and you give 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 to this letting go of everything letting go of all control of all consciousness of all uh, anxiety of all care about anything and it you go right down into this immense depth and then you wake up uh, a little before dawn and the sky is a deep, deep blue, and you can see the stars through the leaves, you know? And that feeling that you get when morning comes, and everything is uh, awakening, and there's a kind of extraordinary freshness to the world, then you really uh, thoroughly get with the dawn. It's a magnificent experience. But you see, it, it, the trouble is that sleep <clears throat> strikes our whole culture as a waste of time. Why have to take this out, you see? Why have to uh, cut it out? But what I'm indicating by giving you this little imagery is how it's possible to enjoy unconsciousness and what restorative value unconsciousness can have in just the same way a death. You know um, Stevenson's poem, Under the wide and starry sky, dig me a grave and let me lie. Glad did I live and gladly die, and I laid me down with a will. Uh, if you can see death in that way, as the just as when you went to sleep, you abandoned all the cares and uh, so on, so in death you abandon all responsibilities. People in the moment of death have had great, uh, marvelous experiences with this, if they got with it. Just think, you don't have to pay any more bills. You don't have to watch the clock anymore. You're not responsible for anyone. You don't have to solve anybody's problems. You don't have to solve your own problems. You don't have to avoid evil. You don't have to do good. Nothing. The whole thing, the whole uh, strain of being somebody is abandoned. And when that happens, some people, before they die, have this enormous access of delight. 
and suddenly see the point of everything. And so, for that reason, all forms of initiation in every place I can think of have invariably been connected with the art of dying in the middle of life. Die now and give up. Give up the compulsion to go on. Give up protecting yourself, looking for security, looking for uh, all those things which when you get them hurt. Don't you know that? That when you get security it hurts because you're worried you're going to lose it. This is terribly true. And so when you die in the middle of life, they used to have, of course, in some uh, religions, ceremonies where you underwent a ritual death. You were put in a coffin. You went down into a deep pit, some symbolism of death. In Christianity, you were drowned. It's called baptism. And uh, that's supposed to be, but they've forgotten, you see, what it was all about. And uh, then when you come up, you would think now, I have been relieved of all responsibility. I have been relieved of all necessity to be anything because I've become nobody. So they give you a new name, but they give you a nobody name instead of a somebody name. In Christianity, when they baptized somebody, they gave him the name of one of the archetypal angels or disciples so that you were no longer, um, say, uh, Laertius, you became Peter. And Peter is one of the nobodies, the great nobodies, you see. So uh, I've noticed recently, I've met a few young people who have abandoned the ordinary idea of naming themselves. I met a young man just the other night. When we said, what is your name? He said, it's you. And uh, I remember a story about Dr. Spiegelberg when uh, he visited my son-in-law, when my son-in-law was very young. And uh, he got this formidable professor, Friedrich Spiegelberg, and said, uh, I don't know what to call you. And Spiegelberg said, just call me Hi You. So this kid's name was You. And I found oh, very, there's, a, there's a man going around who calls himself the Plastic Man. And <laughs> that's all anybody knows him by. Somebody came by the other day and suggested that it would really disturb the whole nation if an enormous number of young people all changed their names to Harry Krishna. <laughs> <laughs> so that their driver's license, you go to, what you do is you just go to the Department of Motor Vehicles and you say, I've changed my name, would you issue this license to Harry Krishna? <laughs> Everybody would be Harry Krishna. <laughs> <laughs> but this, you see, is the thing of, of this death. Death to the role that you thought you were playing, giving up all these uh, responsibilities to amount to anything, to be something. Now, here then comes this absolutely critical point, which is why uh, in every initiatic discipline, there is a discipline. In other words, uh, the, the individual is in some way uh, nurtured for that moment, because obviously, the moment you have given up all the cares and responsibilities, you get an immense access of psychic energy. As all the energy which you've been expending defending yourself is available for something else. So you become quite potentially dangerous. And so always the society has been concerned about what will become a free people. Uh, will they use the energy destructively or constructively? But I'm, I'm, the first thing to realize, to understand, if one is concerned about this, is that there is a great deal of energy attached to this. One normally supposes that human beings are naturally lazy. They're not, the people we call lazy are just tired or they're undernourished, or uh, their organism isn't working properly for reasons of uh, that either tired, they've been fighting themselves too much, uh, and they can't stand it, or else they don't have the right vitamins or something. 
A human being is not lazy, naturally. The human being is a very strange creature. It has an enormous amount of surplus energy. Also does the stickleback fish. This particular fish dances a great deal to get off its, get rid of its surplus energy. And uh, so, in the same way, human beings have all this energy at their disposal. And uh, the, the, the question is how to canalize it in such a way that they don't cause trouble with it. So then, uh, you have, in other words, to be ready with something to do with it. So as to canalize it and not just uh, blow it all off. But it, it is, it's all contingent upon this huge gamble. Let me put it in this way. It is a, the, the initiation death is a gamble. Will you bet me that if you completely abandon uh, all control, you know, where you, the, the ordinary kind of ego control, will control, give it up completely, see? You're not responsible for anything. Will you bet me that if you make that gamble, you will suddenly discover that you are full of... Uh, great great stuff, great energy. And a lot of people will not accept that gamble under any circumstances. They're scared to death of it. Some people will make the gamble and then be like the guy who won the Irish sweepstake and was ruined for life because they don't know how to handle it. And this is one of the great problems of today. When uh, mystical experiences and things like that are so easily and readily available uh, through, for all sorts of reasons, that a lot of people who are very immature get hold of this kind of experience and don't know what to do with it because they don't have uh, the skills with which and in terms of which this kind of experience can be beautifully and creatively used. It isn't just a matter of goodwill. The proverb says the road to hell is paved with good intentions. It isn't enough to be a person of goodwill. It isn't enough to be gentle as a dove. You also have to be wise as a serpent. So I say this in a general preface about getting out of history. Uh, this is the real dropout situation. Uh, a Buddha, for example, in a certain way of talking is a dropout because he dropped off the wheel of samsara, the, the rat race of birth and death where you are always living for a future. But you see, nature abhors a vacuum. If you drop out of one situation, you drop into another. And so, observe where you drop in when you drop out. <laughs> well now, that brings me then to this point that I will call the great diversion. The future is something you cannot work for for exactly the same reason that you cannot work to be happy. Happiness, it's always said, is a byproduct. And it will accrue to you uh, through becoming absorbed in something else altogether, in some other quest altogether. The quest for vision, the quest for uh, doing something, anything, may bring happiness. And so in exactly the same way, 
the good future, the great society, the grand tomorrow, is never going to be attained by working for it directly. When you've got that idea, uh, which is embodied just as much in the five-year plan as it is in the great society, of working for that thing, you will never make it. The only way you can get the good future is by a diversion from time altogether at right angles to the course of history. So what is important now, today, is to create a diversion of such splendor that people will forget about the things they think are important. All their squabbles, all their ridiculous projects for destroying the planet in the name of progress. And give it up because they see something else is going on which is a great deal more fun. It's like, you know, you would have gambling tables at Las Vegas and in some great casino there's been a terrible game going on all night where people are getting more and more emotionally upset and they're all involved and there are tremendous stakes and there's a huge crowd gathered around it. And, oh, what if that doesn't come out and so on. And suddenly somewhere over in another corner of the casino uh, something starts up and then all the people here are threatening to shoot each other and so on. They're over there, they're all laughing. And someone's sitting at the back of the crowd, a few characters, the big crowd, you know, the big serious game going on, they're all looking over. Suddenly hear this thing going on they start turning over and looking at the other table and they begin to peel off and go over there and start joining in that game and finally just at the moment when the immense crash is going to come out and these two great gamblers have gambled the whole universe on what they were doing as if they owned it and they're about to we've got the bomb ready to blow each other up they suddenly look around huh? nobody's watching uh. <laughs> they start looking over there. What's going on over there, you see? So this is the only way in which we can um, do anything about the future at all, is to create a diversion of doing things and living in a way that is non-historical and that is instead of preparing to uh, live the great life, as a result of all sorts of preparations. Use what capacities you now already have for living the great life to do it. Don't wait. And this will create a, a fantastic diversion from history. Then, you see, um, man can attain sanity once again by becoming non-historical. Like the bees like the ants, like the birds. Now, we look at ants and say, oh, ants, we don't want to be like that. That reminds us of communism. But that's only because we are not close enough to ants to see their different personalities. If there are a bunch of ants sitting around and they're apparently to us doing very, very simple things like nurturing eggs and milking green fly, but the ants themselves uh, all look different to each other. They have slightly different colorings, slightly different wiggles on their antennae, which are just as important to them as our facial differences are to us. And they have ways of communicating. And they think that this is a very, very good life. I mean, they have occasional troubles and wars and so on, but they don't. They, they've lived th that way, so far as we know, for millions and millions of years without any progress. Now, you would say that could be very dull. Yes, it would be dull if you kept keeping records and reading them. <laughs> because then you would say, oh, well, you would get too much memory. Now, one, this is a very important thing. Again, d d let me warn you that I always exaggerate. and Therefore, you must take it with certain reservation, which we call a grain of salt. A memory is a good thing. Sure. But it, equally important is a forgettery. We have in the human organism, fortunately and mercifully, a hole at each end. One 
for nutrition and one for elimination. And people don't pay enough attention to the problems of elimination. Uh, at least they pay it in a certain way. They pay attention to whether they're constipated or not. But that's not really the thing. Disposal has become one of the major problems of modern civilization. As a practical problem for the city of San Francisco, where to put the garbage is becoming quite critical. Mountains and mountains and mountains of garbage are arising. Uh, and it is almost as if the human being could be eventually crowded off the earth by his own wastes. That's because uh, we, we haven't really thought about elimination and the problems of elimination. We've only really thought about the problems of keeping storage and the things we store. The, I'm appalled by the files that I'm required to keep, by the correspondence by the increasing accumulation of records. This thing, I don't know why I make these tapes. Some people like to listen to them. I never listen to them because it would take me as long to listen to them as it does to make it. And I would simply be repeating the experience. Why do that? If some student wants to go through something more carefully, fine. But you can read a book so much faster than you can listen to a tape. So there is a thing going on now called the information bomb, which is the proliferation of records. And this has reached such a pitch that it is plainly absurd. Let me give you an, some examples from a field that I'm well acquainted with, Oriental Studies. I mean, you know, this is a small field of relative unimportance. But today, to be a serious scholar in the field of Oriental studies, you have to make like you're a very, very meticulous scientist. Because if you publish an article in the Journal of the American Oriental Society, which is one of the dullest journals ever conceived, and you make a slight mistake with a diacritical mark on a Sanskrit character or a little line wrong in a Chinese character, you will next month be demolished in a footnote by some pesky scholar. And uh, here they all are. They're, they've got so much detail in their head. They know so much. So much information has been acquired. It would take, nobody can possibly master it. The articles come pouring out. If it's that way in Oriental Studies, you should imagine how it is in electronics. It comes and comes and comes and comes. And I was talking the other day to a man who's done a great deal of work in this. And he spent 15 or more years acquiring some Tibetan prints. And he could, out of this material, compile two enormous volumes to be published by University Press with every kind of commentary on these prints. And what would happen? They would be bought by a few big libraries and one or two scholars and nobody would ever read it. So he said to me, I am through with that game. I am an old man. I have seen enough. I have attained all the academic honors I ever could want and I am now going to have fun. And I am going to publish these Tibetan graphics as far out posters. <laughs> but you see what happens. After a certain point, um, this method of intellectual analysis, which was always good and useful in the beginning, and did some very lovely things. After all, when you, you study, uh, let's say you take a course on Renaissance painting from somebody who really knows what it's all about, or on uh, Baroque music, 
or on leader or something like that. It's fascinating to see how those things were put together and why. It's extremely beautiful. But if you go one step beyond that, it's like cooking the souffle just a minute too long. The whole thing disintegrates into dust. And as it is then in the academic world today, where you have an intellectual market going on to do this thing, to turn out graduate students, to turn out professors, who have to put the new graduate students through the paces, and all the field has been covered, so they give them more and more minute and ridiculous things to do, and all the information, because some of it is information, piles in and piles in and piles in. Everybody, including the scholars, suddenly get around one day and say, what on earth are we doing? Especially if it's in a sort of historical, humanistic subject that has no particular technical application. When Aldous Huxley graduated from Balliol at Oxford, his tutor took him aside and said, Mr. Huxley, you have a very distinguished record as a student. Uh, he was in English literature. He said, you should very seriously consider an academic career in English literature. You would make a very fine professor. And Aldous Huxley said, that's most extraordinary. Because I always thought literature was something to be enjoyed, not to be studied. <laughs> and so it is, you see, that the capacity for the enjoyment of scholarship is not really known to these frantic scholars, terrified that they will be demolished in a footnote, and having to make that thing and uh, keep this thing going. You know, realize that the word scholar uh, a school means a place of leisure. <laughs> it was where uh, the, the, the phrase, a scholar and a gentleman. A gentleman meant somebody who didn't have to earn a living because he owned land or something. And therefore he could devote his time to scholarship. And so a scholar and a gentleman would acquire gradually a beautiful library. And he would go into that library and read at an easy pace, no deadlines, no thesis to present at a certain time. He studied for the love of learning. And all those beautiful, li like Bernard Berenson's library at Itati in Florence, is a gentleman scholar's library where he uh, loafed away many, many good hours studying a subject that he loved and got to know a great deal about it. You cannot produce scholarship by this method across the bay. It doesn't work. It produces simply increased harassment, piling up of enormous quantities of irrelevant facts, yes. But a fact isn't a sacred thing just because it's a fact. So you see in this way how a graded education system with goals, with aiming at God only knows what, aiming at a professorship of a higher rank, aiming at a higher salary, well, whatever it is, all that is irrelevant to the actual scholarship. And so as a result, uh, the academic world is a, a lot of political games. With, I say again, some notable exceptions, one knows certain still absolutely genuine scholars who are trying to avoid committee meetings and uh, grading papers and all that kind of thing because they still love learning for its own sake. But there are not many of them. <clears throat> and they have amazing put-downs. If you love learning for its own sake and you're not... Um, worried about all the fine little points that you could get caught up on. They say, you're a popularizer, you're a dilettante, and above all, an amateur. And you know what an amateur is as distinct from a pro? We've come to use the word pro, the man who's, mere, is, who's very competent, an amateur, the dabbler. Amateur meant the man who does it for the love of it, from the root amo in Latin. 
the professional, the man who earns his living at it. It's curious how these things change. So you see, uh, what we must be looking for is a diversion from that whole tendency which makes the professional instead of the amateur. That whole compulsion to use whatever it is that you do for some other end altogether. In other words, I'm baking bread not because I'm a vocation to be a baker, but because it is making money. If the, the, as soon as you do that, you see, you lose track. You lose the point. So the diversion this way, instead of going on with the course of history. Robert Oppenheimer, shortly before he died, said, it is quite obvious that the whole world is going to hell. And the only thing that could possibly prevent this is not trying to prevent it. Because the minute you get meshed with that contest of... Uh, that, you see, there's nothing more... Nobody I know in this world is more hostile than a pacifist on the rampage. <laughs> the bitterness, the, the vitriolic. Once I got in an argument with Margaret Mead. <laughs> Ooh. And she was uh, talking about... She was in a very, very highly emotional state. This was perfectly understandable about the bomb. I said to her, I am a little worried that uh, we could get so excited about this and so violently try to stop the bomb that we might inadvertently blow it off. And she said, you are a fake Swami. You have no consideration for your children and your children's children. You have absolved all responsibility for the course of destiny of history. Uh, <laughs> Well, this is, you see today, a, a very big question. Whether to take part in trying to save the world, or whether to mind your own business. And to uh, do something else. I must say, I wrestle with this question because there's still enough um, of the old conditioning in me say, you really ought to get out there and do something about it. <laughs> After all, you're responsible. You, and you, you've got a hearing and all that kind of thing. And I have to tell you, it takes an enormous effort to, to be lazy. <laughs> to say, now, wait a minute. Go back to Lao Tzu and never forget it. That when I see a man getting ready to put the world in order, I know there will be great trouble. <laughs> Govern a great state as you cook a small fish. Now, you see the puzzle in connection with all this. Is the problem of the sorcerer's apprentice. You remember in this story which, uh, what was his name, Duca, who was that musician who made this thing? Da -da -da -ding, de -ding, de -de 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 -ding. Um, he used the magic to try and save the work. And it got out of control. And when the broom wouldn't stop fetching water, he didn't know how to stop the spell, he chopped it. And immediately it turned into two brooms, bringing twice as much water, see? And as he hit at them, the fragments turned in each one into a new broom, bringing more water. And that's the situation we're in. See, we're in an economy which has to expand or collapse. We talk about uh, a growing business. It means one that's making more and more and more and more and more every year. So everybody has got to be incited to want more and more and more products. 
And if you don't do it, you're a bad consumer. And there are all kinds of ways of pressuring you into being a good consumer. You come around here and you live on a houseboat. Well, we don't pay taxes because we're a boat. And, uh, well, that worries people. And they say, oh, don't you have a sewage here? And uh, everybody says, no. <laughs> well, I say, that's a serious health problem. Well, it, it just isn't, because everybody who lives around here is very healthy. <laughs> and uh, the main problem in the bay is industrial waste, chemicals, kill the fish. Fish like our waste, especially mackerel, they thrive on it. All you've got to do is bring a big shipment of mackerel and dump it. <laughs> and then what about the, the birds, you know? They, they deposit their excrements in the bay, and at certain times of year, you can hardly see the water for birds. What are they going to do? Have posses going around shooting the birds because they're fouling the bay? What they want in this bay is um, distilled water with a 10% saline additive for realistic effect. <laughs> <laughs> so the thing is then, if you live in this sort of thing, eventually somebody says, well, we won't insure you. Or um, you're doing this regulations wrong and that regulations wrong. The real reason is that you're not being a good consumer. You don't own the right kind of appliances, the right kind of car, the right kind of anything. And so you're considered a bad consumer, and you've got to go on owning. Somebody uh, made a fantasy a little while ago about the future where everybody uh, is required by law to possess enormous flashy cars and fantastic expensive things, and only great business tycoons will be able to get away with driving jalopies and wearing old clothes. <laughs> so, but you see, in that situation where you must, you must, you must increase, 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 increase like this, you're simply not viable. What's happening to you is the way you kill poison oak. You feed certain hormones, which you paint on the leaves, and this promotes the growth so excessively that it just blow up. And we're in a situation like that where our progress is cancer. We're going to blow up by sheer... Blah. Unless, unless, you see, we stop. Stop the future. Time must have a stop. And create a diversion. <laughs>